Well, amen. It's good to see you this morning. It's good to be back. <clears throat> Terry told me y'all usually get out about 12, and that clock up there says a quarter after 10, so y'all get comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> amen. Uh, I'm just kidding. But, uh, hey, it's, a, it's an honor and privilege to be here. I do appreciate Brother Terry, and uh, I'm glad he came through the surgery good, and it's a honor and privilege to be here again. I think I was here about, I don't know, about near a year ago, pretty close. And uh, I tell people a lot of times, I'm in a lot of different churches, and I say, well, if, he, if you invite me to come, it's a blessing. If you invite me back, it's just short of a miracle. <laughs> so uh, I'm a, you know, I, I'm not a pastor. I'm an evangelist. And uh, God's not laid on my heart to pastor, and if he did right now, I would follow and go that way, but uh, I said that to say, to get invited back twice, a lot of the messages are, feel like God lays on my heart, or kind of sort of in your face, they're, hey, hey, if you really don't want to know, don't ask me, and a lot of them are stern, and uh, I, to be honest with you, in this day and time, it seems like there's a lot of messages that <coughs> people just simply don't want to hear in this day and time. Uh, We've got away from some things, and I can remember seeing things when I was young, being raised in church, how people sought God. When I say that, I say, praise God, they needed Him. Not just wanting to show up from time to time, they needed Him. And they spent time in prayer. They spent time in the Word of God. And you can tell they had God on their life, and it was evident when they come into God's house. And boy, the power of God was in the place. And I didn't know much about it as a kid. I just knew I'd need to sit there and be still because something was moving bigger than I was. But now we're at the place to where, <clears throat> now mind you, anything I say, I'm not necessarily talking about you. I'm just making a general statement. We're in a time now to where church seems to have a, I don't know, it looks to me like it's kind of a ritual. We just come in and we kind of go through the motions. And I ask people a lot of times when I go from place to place, I ask people, did you come looking for something this morning? Did you actually come thinking, okay, boy, I praise God, God's going to show up. He's going to do a work. I need Him. They were singing a song called God on the Mountain. And He's still God in the valley. I'm going to tell you something this morning. Do you know why you go through valleys? Because you'll have a tendency to pray just a little bit different when things are struggling. You know, I like to preach out of the Old Testament. And if you look at the Old Testament, you'll find Israel in so many places the world. It looks like they're riding a roller coaster. Everything's going real good. God set them up. They're setting up on the mountain. Everything's wonderful. And the more wonderful it is, the farther they'll slowly start getting away from God. God will send something, whether it be bondage, captivity, whatever be overtaken in a battle, they'll be in a mess, and then they'll start, Lord help us, Lord forgive us, Lord save us, and God will come back through and He'll bring them out, get them back up on the mountain, just for them to just, the longer they're up there, they'll start the whole process again, and we're that way a lot. So if you want to know sometimes when it seems like you struggle, man, it just comes in, all the time. Most of the time God got a lot of us there just because we just tend to pray a little more fervently, if you will. We tend to seek Him just a little bit more when we're there. We don't seem to thank Him good as much as we pray when we really need Him. So uh, I'll say this and I get in the message. I just felt like the Holy Ghost was talking to me on the way over here and we was riding down the road. Don't let anybody in, on this road, around the corner, don't let anybody on this, around and up, I'll just say a half mile radius, we'll just use that. Don't let anybody in a half mile radius that lives near this church go to hell not knowing that you don't love them. And you said something to them about Jesus. We need to go and tell. I believe they called that the Great Commission. You know, that wasn't just for pastors. 
evangelist or somebody stand up and have the privilege to open up the word and preach to you. That was for everybody that's born again. I don't want to work with anybody that didn't know that I knew the keys to get to heaven and never told them or never showed them to them. And that got to bother me riding over here. Because I know people I work with I hadn't said nothing to. I don't know why I was supposed to tell you that, but there you go. It's good to see y'all. Y'all got smile at me. Ah, that's a good looking crowd right there. All right, y'all got your Bibles. Turn to Genesis chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6 is a very familiar, very familiar. Everybody's going to know this. Uh, this will be borderline. A part of this might be a little bit of a Sunday school lesson, but uh, what I want to do is I, you know, I, I'll probably fight to try to not to get to the end as quick as I can because uh, that's where my points or my applications are. Uh, and I'll just tell you, I, I love type and shadow preaching, if you know what that is. When I make that analogy, I usually tell people, when I say type and shadow, I like to be able to see Jesus when you don't think he's there. And you find Jesus on every page in your Bible. Sometimes you have to look for him a little harder. But you can find him everywhere. So when I say things like type and shadow, uh, for example, anytime you see Egypt in the Bible, it's referring to the world. Everybody say amen. amen. When you like Pharaoh, Pharaoh was a type of Satan. He was a type of the devil. Moses being a, a deliverer was a type of Christ. You know, those type of analogies. That's what I, when I say type and shadow, that's what I mean. So, uh, I got a couple I'd like to share, you know, when we get toward the end of the message, but uh, I want to start reading, it's uh, Genesis chapter 6, I'll start reading in verse 5. Verse 5 says, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. I believe that means all the time. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and creeping thing and fowls of the air, for it repented me that I had made them. And verse 8 says, But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for another opportunity. My, my, one more time, just be able to open up your precious word and say something. I thank you, Lord, that you put me here and give me the opportunity to do this. I appreciate this church, Brother Terry. I pray, God, you continue to bring him to a speedy recovery. I pray, Lord, for everyone here this morning. Lord, I pray, God, you'd get me out of the way, quick, fast, and in a hurry. And I pray, God, you'd deal and speak to our hearts. Lord, they won't get it from me. They get it from you. And I pray, God, that you just do your work as only you can. Search and examine hearts. Lord, I ask just by chance, first one here this morning lost, yet in their sin, I pray today will be the last day that they're lost. I ask you to save them, Father. I pray, Lord, if there's one way we're not where they're supposed to be, Lord, would you bring them home? Lord, would you speak to their heart? Let them recognize, Father, there's nothing in this ungodly world to cling to. Lord, have your wonderful way. Speak to us, I pray. I love you. I thank you for all that you do in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, I'm going to preach a message entitled, It's Going to Rain. It's Going to Rain. Uh, I'm going to say about 10, 10 generations or so after Adam, You've got a guy named Noah. But just to back up a little bit, I'm sure everybody's familiar with a guy in the Bible named Enoch. Enoch, 365 years old, after he walked with God for 300 years. The Bible said he walked with God and was not, for God took him. Well, he had a son. Does anybody know what his son's name was? I told you this would be like Sunday school. He had a son, his name was Methuselah. Everybody's probably familiar to everybody. He's the oldest man in the Bible. Does everybody know how old he was? Nine 
169. That's old. Well, he had a son. His name was Lamech. And Lamech had a son, and his name was Noah. And I was thinking about them, and I was thinking about the man from Enoch to Methuselah to Lamech. I got to thinking, man, Noah growing up as a young'un, I couldn't help but think, man, what a group of boys to be around. Pops, Grandpa, Great Grandpa. I believe they was a great influence right there. And I love this part. Because I, I, I know what I said earlier about what I seen as a kid growing up in church and, you know, what I see now. I, when I go to different churches and get to see different people, I, I, I'm immediately drawn and I say this with all due respect. So please, nobody, I'm, I'm a million miles from offending anybody. But when I see older folks, it blesses my heart. Because I always look at folks, you think about folks that's been in for 40, 50, 60 years been saved. Hey, praise God, I call them the seen it generation. I mean, they seen it. They got to see the power of God move. I don't know about people, but I, I kind of like it when things is, you can tell by me talking, I like things a little loud. I like to hear somebody say amen. And I can say this, and I say this so often, I can remember growing up that you can see grannies sitting on the corners going down the aisles, they didn't say a whole lot, but they always reminded me of them ones that, praise God, I believe when they bowed their head to pray, I believe they could ring heaven's gate. And it'd get on, and the Holy Ghost come in, and I could see them little hankies waving. Praise God, I miss the hankies being waved in the house of God anymore. I don't go to many places rare that I ever see anything like that happen anymore. And I'll be honest with you, I don't like it. I remember some men that still praise God that sit in what they call the amen corners. Anybody remember anything like that? Used to have an amen corner. <clears throat> and you get to some places, praise God, that's so over. And I'll tell you, if you ever want to preach a man to death, amen. That's just a year in agreement with what he's talking about. And praise God, I mean, it'd get on. And we had a vocabulary. They used to be years ago, there was a vocabulary. People knew how to say, I told one church, I was picking out them, I said, I'm going to come over on Tuesday nights and give y'all a proper way. We're going to have a class from 6.30 to 7 on the proper way to say amen. And it's head man, glory. I miss that. I don't know about you, but I miss it. And I'll tell you while I'm, while I'm right here on this subject, this is the quietest world you're ever going to live in, regardless of where you go. So you might as well get used to a little bit of racket. And I tell a lot of people, I said, praise God, if you don't like shouting, if you don't like all that carrying on, you better not get on a cloud with me because I'm going to be raising the ruckus. I'm going to be shouting. Do y'all realize what the King of Glory did for you? Seemed like we kind of forgot. Seemed like he owed it to us, but he didn't. Boy, he paid an awful price just so we could know something about this salvation. And have an eternal home in heaven. That ought to make us happy. Sometimes a lot of us, I, I say, maybe we ought to tell our face how happy we are sometimes. <laughs> Y'all grin at me. But anyway, I was talking about the older folks and everything, and I, I thought about Noah, and I thought about him being able to spend time around that. And I thought, you know, you young people, don't take for granted them ones that are a little bit older than you, around you in your life. I know they seem kind of, well, old fogies. You don't live in the day in which I live, so you really don't know. They know more than you do. And it may have changed, but it ain't all changed that much. So y'all pay attention to them older folks when they start giving you a piece of advice on whether it be something in church, in life, or whatever the case may be. Because see, they've been where you're going. And no matter how much you think things has changed, it ain't changed that much. They still know a thing or two. And I praise God for them. They're trying to build a bridge so you don't have to go through the muck, the mire, and the clay. But it's funny how we don't seem to listen. When I was 18, I knew more than all of you put together. And I thought I had the world by the tail, and you couldn't tell me nothing. 
Come to find out, Mama wasn't so dumb after all. Amen. That right there is good. You all pay attention to that. But I think Noah got some advice. I, I believe he was surrounded by some good folks. I believe them folks knew something about God. I know especially great grandpa because he walked where God and was not for God took him. Pay attention to the older folks around you. They might be able to help you. But you know what's funny right through here that Noah got to the place to where I don't know what all he was doing, but per God, the world got in a mess. And it repented him that he made God. Or <laughs> made man, sorry. And he said, you know what? I, I'm just going to gonna destroy the thing. Y'all don't mind me paraphrasing a little bit, do you? Uh, I'm going to destroy the earth. But then the Bible said Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And he goes on to tell you, I, I, y'all know, know Noah, good gracious. He, he said, I want you to build me an ark. A what? I said this one time, everybody looked at me funny. This is how I picture things. It's how my mind works. I, I, I'm sure Noah didn't say this, but I'm in my own mind. I love Jesus just like he does. You want me to build a what? An ark? A boat. Why? Now Noah at the time, Noah lives nowhere near water. And what God is describing him to build is the biggest thing to date. Nobody had ever seen any side of building or vessel this big. And God goes on to tell him, I want you to build me an ark. I want you to build it in our terms. It's going to be 450 foot long. It's going to be 75 foot wide. It's going to be 45 foot tall, three floors. And you're going to pitch it within, without. And I'm going to tell you what, it's going to rain. He said, what? It had never rained. Everything that got watered or whatnot come up from God's irrigation system and underground. And everything got watered just like this. And every one of you, a couple of us nodding. That's your Sunday school lesson right there. Y'all have had to have been through this before. But I'm trying to go somewhere, just kind of give you a set the platform, if you will. God told Noah to build an ark. He told him this when he was 580 years old. He had 120 years to do it. And I got to thinking about the other crowd, the, the ones where God said he repented that he made man because their thoughts were on evil continually. Does any of this sound familiar in the day in which we live? I believe Matthew 24, about 37, I'm guessing. And as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. They was evil continually. But I found this guy named Noah that found grace in the eyes of the Lord. You know, if you saved this morning, you found grace. In the eyes of the Lord. You know what? how hard it is? I, I mean, we could all sit down and I'm sure each one of us could talk about how tough it is in this day and time to live a Christian life. I'm telling you, if you don't know, your country wants God out of it. <clears throat> and I'll give you this just for a nugget. God has always been outnumbered, but He has never been outpowered. And he never will be. And you keep on keeping on. You keep holding to the hand that holds the world. Because everything's going to be all right. You'll check the back of the book. You'll find we win. Hallelujah. <laughs> but watch. I got to thinking about him getting these instructions from God. And I know myself, I, I, I would, this is just me, I would probably be, you want me to do what? How big? I'll find no questioning from no. I can't find it in my Bible. I can't find any discouragement. I can't find any doubt no matter what movie you might want to watch. I can't find it in the Word of God. And I believe Noah sets out to build this ark. I believe he was obedient. <clears throat> and mind you, Noah is living right in a world gone wrong. 
I'll tell you where you're at today. If you're walking with Jesus, you're trying to live right in a world gone wrong. You want to know how people think about you when you name the name of Jesus? Next time you're pumping gas and the person next to you is pumping gas too, ask them if they know Christ. Watch how they look at you. It's getting bad. I say this and I don't want to veer too far off the message because I want to get to where I want to go. But I hate telling you all this, but your country is not coming back to God. I'm sorry. God's always had a remnant. He always will. God's coming back for His church. And He's not coming back for a harlot. He's coming back for a bride. And the Bible says that the bride had made herself ready. Now, I'm going to tell you this. I don't know what we'll have to do, what we'll have to go through before Jesus comes. But I'm telling you, we all be getting ready. Because it's going to hit this country. And I don't know. God will get us to a place where we need him again. The problem with us right now is we don't need him. Everybody looks at me funny when I kind of make those statements. But we don't need God. We got everything we need. Business is good. Okay, inflation is starting to come up a little bit, but boy, we're all making money. Business are setting record numbers. We're making money. We're making money. And it's amazing how we'll take God's will and associate it with some, something materialistic. You know, if everything was fine and dandy about this whole walk with Christ thing, Paul could have written 13 slash 14 letters sitting in the king's palace instead of sitting in a prison cell. This ain't all kumbaya on the way to glory while we hold hands. This thing gets tough. This walk gets hard. And I'll tell you what we do in this damn time, man. Holy Ghost doesn't run me off of this for a minute, so y'all just time out. Let me have this a minute. We're living in a day right now. We don't want to do it God's way. We're going to do it our way because we found a better way to do it. God said to pray. God said to study. He give you those two things. Those two things alone. Watch this. If you'll do those two things, effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth what? Much. Much. Bible says, 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Study to show thyself approved unto God and the workman. Need not be ashamed. Rightly divide the word of truth. Them are the two things God give you. And he said, if you'll do those two things, if you'll do them fervently, I mean, if you'll seek me, it's amazing how everything else in your Christian walk will come together like a hand in a glove, and you'll find out God will hang around you. Period. That's it. <clears throat> but the church is busier than it's ever been with less results than ever before. And we try to figure out ways how we're going to feed somebody, help somebody, do this, we're going to do this, we're going to do this. You want me to tell you why we do those things? Because we won't do it the way God said to do it. He said to pray and study. You will see fire in the house of God again? Go back to praying and study. Car wash won't get her done. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with car wash. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with helping somebody, doing good. All those things. I'm not, don't misunderstand me. But I'm telling you right now, you want the power of God on the place? You'll have to go back to praying and study. Period. No other way. Won't work. Nothing else. And I'll tell you what that'll do. That'll be so stinking hard on your flesh, your flesh will absolutely despise it, hate it. So here's, here's the next thing we do. All right, so how can I get my, be spiritual, <clears throat> but yet not, I'm going to go back to the old folks, but not be so dogmatic crazy as they were when, back in the day. All that praying. Man, I can remember I can remember men as a kid. I can remember they'd go out in the woods and fall over stumps and pray for hours. Grandma, all I ever heard her do standing at the kitchen window washing dishes. Now, I didn't hear a lot of complaining. I heard about how good God was. Just sat and meditate and just kind of talk to God washing dishes. All the time. All the time. But you know what I found out through watching them? They had an honest-to-God loving relationship with the King of Glory. 
You know why most Christians are miserable today? Because we don't have much of a relationship with Him. We have a ritual. We have a routine and a rut. Uh-oh, it's Sunday morning. I didn't mean to just come over here and bash all y'all. I love y'all. We love you too. <laughs> hey, man, sister, I got one. That's, you remember when I, was, when I started this, I said most of them ain't. My message ain't popular. This is things God lays on my heart. I tell people I feel like a modern day Jeremiah because all I go is preach go place to place. Preach gloom and doom. I said, oh Lord, here he comes. I don't want to hear it. And I just think, if you want it, God's give you the way to get it. We just got to get back to it. But we're in a world that puts so much in front of us. And the Bible says lean not to your own understanding, but we do it. We lean to our own understanding trying to figure out we're going to make this work. What we want to do is we want to do spiritual things in a secular way. Spiritual things in a secular way won't work. They will not work. And I tell this everywhere I go. And people look at me like a corn dog on a stick. Like, what? when are you going to get off on this and preach something else? And God said, tell them this. Tell them this. And I keep telling people this and I don't pay me no attention. And I finally got to a place where the Lord said, "You get, I, I'll, I'll take care of it. We're not all going to like it, but we're going to get back to a place where we need it. He said, build an ark. So I believe Noah started to build his ark, and I believe he was working on that thing. These are little things I just get tickled at myself because I know how I am. I, I think, you know, after I've been doing this about 45 years, and I'm working, and I'm getting her done, and at some point in time, I'm thinking, are you sure I heard you right? I mean, because I don't know about you, but it seems like God takes his time when it comes to things, especially like when you pray for something. I don't know about you, but I don't get the answer two minutes after I pray. Very rare. It seems like it's going to take a while. And you know, sometimes they'll take long enough to where you'll start second guessing if God really laid something on your heart. And I wonder if Noah sometimes going, that's just what I bet you. Are you really, is this really what you want? But you know, he kept with it. I believe Noah said it was going to rain. I believe the neighbors thought it was nuts. I believe the neighbors took a long way around to the back to their house because they didn't want to go by where he was because he was going to hear, they were going to have to hear him say, it's going to rain. God's going to send judgment. Crazy man out there talking about rain. We don't even know what rain is. Ain't never rained before. I, I, don't, know, I don't know what he's talking about. He's crazy. Well, what kind of pressure his youngins felt? You know, your daddy lost his mind. I don't know what they were doing. But I know... Noah stayed faithful. I didn't hear a lot of grumbling. I can't hear no complaining. I see him staying with the stuff. He just staying with it. Could I encourage y'all this morning to just stay with it? If you do anything for God, there's going to be somebody around to criticize what you do anyway. So if you'll just, you said y'all going to go through Daniel. You said chapter 1, verse 8. 8 through 21. Verse 8. He purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's meat. I'll tell you what that verse of scripture means. I believe Daniel just went on and settled it. I'm going with God. Period. Sometimes you just have to take a bulldog stance about stuff and say, I'm going with God. Period. I ain't letting this bother me. I'm not going to let this bother me. You don't like what I'm doing? Pray for me. Don't tell somebody next to you if you don't like what somebody's doing, tell God on them. Because there's a better chance not that God will start dealing with you instead of them. Make up your mind to go with Him. I see that in Noah. I didn't see somebody try to... They might have talked out to talk him out of building that ark, but he kept building that ark. He stayed with it. He stayed with it. Now, y'all know this. Got the animals together. Two by two. Y'all ain't going to believe this, but if you go to chapter 7, verses 1, 2, 3, 4, you'll find out that I, got, I asked this question randomly. I said, is that it? Did you just bring two by two and that's it? 
Because you'll find out in chapter 7, 1, 2, and 3 that there were certain ones they brought seven of them. Brought seven because I'm going to go off on them and say when they landed on land again, they're going to need something to sacrifice. So they brought clean animals in. That was another one in Sunday school lessons. And number two, that's why you should study your Bible. Because there's, there's a lot in there if you get in there and look at it. All right, y'all stay with me just a minute. I'm going somewhere. Get the animals together. Get them all in the ark. Who shut the door? God shut the door. Now I'm going to talk about the, what I was talking about earlier with the type and shadow. Let me get through a couple little analogies, a little bit of reference in how this affects you and your walk, and I close. See there? Ain't, ain't nowhere near 12 o'clock. <laughs> I got the most response out of y'all when I started talking about that time. <laughs> God shuts the door. Now I told you a minute ago this ark is 450 foot long, 75 wide, 45 tall. God got eight people, known as wife, Ham, Shem, Japheth, their wives. That's it. That's the only people. Now Noah has worked on this for 120 years. It's going to rain. Judgment's coming. Not one convert. Praise God, if he'd have been on our mission board, we'd have dropped support. There's no way this man's in the will of God didn't get a convert. Ain't that how kind of we look at things? But you never, you might be amazed at what God's doing in your life that don't really make a whole lot of sense, but see, God knows what he's doing. All he needs you to be is obedient to what he tells you to do. Most of us has got to work in and get our hands on it, and we usually turn it into a mess that takes a whole lot longer for God to get done when it needs to get done because we won't get our hands off of it. That's good preaching even if it is me. He did what God told him to do. Family's in. Animal's in. And God shuts the door. It was 120 years there that he preached. It's going to rain. I believe he warned. I believe he built. He warned. He preached. Finally come to a day where God shuts the door. And I tell you, it's going to be just like that right now. We're living in a very similar time. One day God's going to shut this door. That door in this day and time is going to be the day of grace. That door's going to shut. But watch. Now they say that being the size of this ark, that you could get roughly somewhere between 520 and 570 box cars in this ark. If you want to picture that, pull up to a railroad crossing and that big arm come down and you got to sit there and wait for 500 plus cars to come by. Y'all don't mind me saying so. And Randolph, Davidson County, we call it, you're going to be there a while. You're going to be there a minute. Huge. But you know, if you'll go studying it, you'll find out that after everything was in the ark, it only took up about a third of the boat. And this is where I step back in and go, if, if it wasn't going to take up by the third, couldn't I built like a, you know, 75 foot long, 45 foot wide, 15 foot tall. I mean, why did I build this great big boat? It ain't but a third full. Don't make no sense. Type of shadow. In your Bible, when he was building that, he said to pitch it within and without, putting all that mud in there where nothing could get in and it was sealed up. Do you notice everybody that was in the ark missed judgment? Everybody say amen right there? Everybody that was in the ark missed judgment. That ark in your Old Testament is a type of Christ. Everybody that was in the ark missed judgment. If you are in Christ today, you will miss the judgment that's coming. 
We'll have to go through things. We'll have to go through trials and tribulations. The Bible says we would. But you will miss the judgment. Mind you, it's funny how everybody that was in, the boat was in the water, but the water wasn't in the boat. You know, big difference right there. See, you are in the world, but be not of the world. As long as you're in the world, you know what? You ought to represent. You are an ambassador to the Lord Jesus Christ. But you know, we ought not have the water in the boat. You get so much water in the boat, there'll be trouble coming. Because eventually it's going to sink. We were in the boat. We missed judgment. Now, a third big old boat. Why does it have to be so big? Because God made room for every human being that was on the earth that if you would have just come, you could miss judgment. And when Christ died on an old rugged cross, he was big enough to where if everybody would come, you would miss judgment. He said, anyone will come unto me, I'll in no wise cast out. Come. Come take the water of life freely. I, biggest words were come. C-O-M-E. See, let the children come. O, let the old folks come. M, let the middle-aged come. E, praise God, just let everybody come. Come on. I want to save you. And he made room. There's room in the ark for you. And here's my second point, and I'll close. How many of you have ever been deep sea fishing? I've been out on a been out on the lake, on the ocean, I'm sorry. Whew, that's a big body of water. I always think, I don't, God measured that in the palm of his hand. And they say after about eight miles you lose sight of land, and I've been out once or twice in a big bunch of water. And we were fishing. And you know, I'm trying to keep my sense of direction, if you will. You know, if you didn't have a compass or a GPS, you'd be a mess. And we'd be fishing a little bit, and I said, is land that way? I said, yeah. And we'd run over here and fish, and I said, land that way? I said, yeah. And we'd go over here and fish, and we were running around. I said, land that way right there? He said, you're going to Europe. <laughs> sense of direction was just messed up. Couldn't get a bearing on them. It's like, there's nothing but water. Everywhere. And I watch God give Noah instructions. And I just, when I read those verses of Scripture, you know, I, I wanted to get on, Noah found grace and I was, Lord, I didn't go in any particulars about how what he told him to do to build the ark. But you can definitely go over and study. It's just chapter 2 over. Uh, but when you see God give him instructions to build the ark, there's one thing that I can't find. This is application, so pay attention. All that boat, great big boat, said it rained, waters got roughly 24, 25 foot higher than the tallest peak on earth. And out of all that, I could not find a rudder. I couldn't find a way for him to be able to drive the ship. And you know why? Because God's driving. And you know what God wants to do in your life? He wants to be able to drive it. And you know why it can't for a lot of us? Because we won't get our hands off the rudder. So the biggest point I want to make this morning is who's guiding your ship? In a time where I tell you it's going to rain, judgment is coming. It's going to hurt. And we'll go through something before we get out of here. But I believe it'll be just what we need for us to get close to God again. My question to you, who's got their hands on your rudder? Are you letting God guide and direct your life the way he sees fit? Or do you feel like God needs a little help? We're all guilty of that every time, from time to time. I, there's been more than once I feel like I got a problem and God's not answering it fast enough. And I'm going to put God in my little box and stick him in my pocket. And I'm going to go over here and handle it. Because it's, you know, I just feel better if I can help God out because, you know, it's my problem. 
I have no doubt God can solve your problem, but you know, mine gets a little big from time to time. Don't we all think that way? Just say amen, I'll move on. Hmm. Somebody come play something on the piano for me. I don't give an invitation. Hey, the, the altar has been open since we got here, I believe. But I just want to ask you point blank with, uh, with every head bowed, every eye closed. I, I don't do none of this for any type of embarrassment. I, I'm not interested in embarrassing anybody. I want us all right where we're supposed to be with God Almighty and knowing that the day He comes that you're ready to go. Do you know Christ this morning in full pardon and forgiveness of sin? Do you know that He died on an old rugged tree? Do you know He would have done it if you'd have been the only one here? If you'd have been the only one on earth, He'd have done it just for you because He loved you. He paid a sin debt that you and I could not pay. Rose again the third day, sits at the right hand of the Father making intercession for you and for me. He did this so you'd have the opportunity to go to heaven. And if you'll come to Him, you can go to that wonderful place. I'm telling you this morning, it won't be about how good you are. It won't be about what you've done or how much you've helped your neighbor. If it would have been about all that or being good, Christ never would have had to come down on no rugged tree. So I ask you this morning, just, just by chance, the Holy Ghost is leading with your heart and you're lost. And you need to be saved. Would you just slip your hand up? I'd just love to pray for you. I won't come to where you're at. I won't embarrass you. I promise. I'd just like to pray for you. Anyone? Child of God, let me ask you a question. Who's got their hands on your rudder? You feel like any time just to give it to God? Ain't it time... Don't you get kind of weary in this walk? A lot of times we get weary in the walk because we're trying to handle it. We won't give God a place in our lives to handle it. Ain't it time to give it to Him? Would you come? Would you come and pray and say, God, I've had my hand on this rudder too long. I just want to give it to you. There's a sweet place in this walk. And it's amazing how if you'll just give it to God, you can find yourself, so to speak, in the place where the milk and honey flows. I'm not telling you you won't have trouble. You might end up with more trouble. But I can tell you this. If you'll give it to God and you'll do it the way He wants it done, I promise you that you can get to a place where God will be so magnified that you'll pay a lot more attention to Him than you do the troubles that come your way. Problem now is most of us pay more attention to the problem and less about the God that can take care of things. Anyone? Absolutely. Absolutely. Young ones, grand young ones. You know, I hear people say it. You want to. People will. Your walk will always speak louder than your talk. Always. I'm sure you've heard before, but you might be the only Bible some people ever read. The lost people don't read the Bible. They read you. And they watch. It'd be better to have never been born than to be born in miss that city. You got friends, you got family, boy, come to the altars of
Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to be in your house once again. We thank you for these fine folks, and I pray, God, that your blessing be upon every one of them. I pray, God, you'd go into their homes. I pray you'd be with them. I pray all and every need that they have, Lord. I pray you'd just minister to them in your own special way, and I pray you'd do it your way. And I pray, God, you'd help us, Lord, from time to time just to see the direction that you're going. And I pray, God, we'd just lean on you and trust you in everything that we do. Lord, I pray you'd draw us closer today than we've ever been. I pray, God, that we could go out of here change folks. I pray, Lord, that we could go out in such a way to where people see more of you and less of us. Lord, we need you in this time. I sure do thank you for being so good. I appreciate Brother Terry and the opportunity to come down. I pray you continue to heal him, bring him back to a full recovery. And I pray you bless him be upon him and his home. I just thank you for all that you do, Lord. I love you. I thank you. I appreciate these folks that come with the concern of family, youngins, grand youngins, Lord, that have a, a desire, a burden, a longing to see their family saved. And I pray, God, you'd do a work and honor that prayer. I pray, God, that you'd lead God and direct us, bring us back next appointed time. We love you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, God.